thumbs up. That's good. Um, I, I don't have any uh, slides. They, they make me nervous. Uh, and uh, sharing screens, I'm an absolute techno uh, dunce. So I prefer to just uh, talk. Uh, I guess um, the other thing to say is uh, I've been so busy this week that I've slightly cobbled this together in terms of, um, you know, I can't present you with a nice, coherent uh, sort of view on the whole of what Brighton does in terms of uh, food enterprise. But I have a lot of involvement in uh, many aspects of it. Uh, and I'm also feeling a bit rough. I'm I'm a kind of long COVID guy and uh, it's it's uh, it's not been very easy. So at the moment, I'm feeling a bit miserable. And uh, my hopefully my presentation won't be too miserable, but uh, at times it can kind of get you down a bit how hard all this stuff is. Um, I guess my journey, I, I used to run my own cafe called Seven Bees Cafe. Uh, I used a lot of local produce. Uh, it was quite satisfying. Um, I kind of scratched an itch in that I wanted to find out what it was like to take something I loved, which was cooking, and I found very relaxing, and turn it into something I uh, did for a living, and, uh, and I enjoyed it. Uh, but while I was doing it, we bought our local community hall in my uh, in my community. It was going to get turned into uh, houses. And uh, I suddenly found myself just far more uh, satisfied. I found like, literally a sort of feeling in my stomach that this community lark was uh, was better than trying to make money out of selling food. So, uh, so that brought me to the Bevy pub. So the Exeter Street Hall, which was in my local um, hall, is a community benefit society. And so for those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically a, a, a format of organisation, an incorporated body that's a, a cooperative uh, and it uh, is run, tends to be run by committee. So you have shareholders, the shareholders essentially pass their power to the committee and run it on their behalf. And that committee acts a little bit like a board in a, in a normal company. Uh, the bevy was a, a in its infancy of trying to um, uh, save a pub in uh, in Moulscombe in Brighton, which is a very low income area compared to the rest of Brighton. And they were also a community benefit society. I got very excited, mainly by meeting these insane people who were trying to raise 200,000 pounds in, a, in an area where some of the parts of Moulscombe are in the bottom 3% in the country. They were selling shares at 10 pound a head. Uh, that's way lower than any other community pub that's been bought in the last sort of 10 years. There's about 150 of them, but the Bevy's the only one really that's on a housing estate and is owned by ordinary working class people. Uh, so to cut a long story short, they managed to uh, gain access to the pub. We don't actually own the building, but we run uh, a, a, a pub. And uh, just for people to come, it's the only pub on the estate. There's 18,000 people live here. So if you imagine your own town, your own city, where you draw a circle round, there's 18,000 people living it, and there's one pub. We thought we were going to be in Clover because it's the only pub. Turned out it was such a bad pub in the past before we, before the community bought it, that people were very wary about going there. It's a really hard thing to do to run a community pub, and about a year in, one we realised it's a lot harder than we think, and we were probably going to. But two, we realised that it's really hard for people with no money to go to a pub no matter how cheap the pub is. And we had a big celebratory day and we actually had a hog roast. And there were, there were hundreds of people at the pub that we'd never seen before and the penny dropped. So the reason they were there is there, were free, there was free food and free entertainment. And from that moment on, community food hub. So we didn't set out to be a community food hub, but we realized that, that food and food inequality and food poverty lies at the center really of all food poverty, uh, of all poverty. I mean, people haven't got enough money. That's why they're skint. We could solve that one by giving people more money. In the meantime, you have to have community hubs and you have to have places like the Bevy to bridge the gap to the, the hopefully the day arrives when we actually uh, take poverty seriously in this country. So the Bevy tries to do lots of things around food. I think the most relevant one, I think, for this, uh, I think it came up earlier in the chat, is that um, we, we did community cooking for kids. And the way that we managed to get the, the people that we knew would benefit the most from this, uh, this, these free cookery lessons 
uh, is going through the school and going through the people who already worked in the community and encouraging those kids to go to those lessons. And again, it was a profound kind of moment when you could see kids that when they started their first lesson came very shyly into the pub and didn't really have eye contact with people. And by the second or third lesson, they were actually walking through the pub with the stuff that they'd made, uh, showing it to everyone in the pub and then sitting down with their families and eating all that food. So, you know, that that really taught me a lesson is that that's how you do community cooking. That's the best way to do it amongst peers. Amongst people who know each other, cooking the things they want. Yes, a, 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 an enthusiastic cook will always slip in celery and couscous and 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 whatever's around to try and encourage people to eat better because because you love food. But most importantly, you just get people to be confident and proud around food. Um, in terms of so so the the, the bevy uh, was very important in COVID. Uh, so it 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 because. The Bevy is a proper community hub, and not only does it try and be uh, uh, serve the community in its own sense, but it also likes to link up with uh, the other organisations and community organisations in our area. So five days before lockdown, the first lockdown, we had a big community meeting. We just chopped up all the stuff that needed doing. And I tell you, Molscombe, you know, was was fine almost. In COVID, because we really, we really went at it, and we were ready for it, and we all spoke to each other, and we all got stuff done. And so we had, we were cooking meals before lockdown even started, and gave away free meals to, to families through the schools, through the existing organisations, and eventually the council caught up with us uh, and, and got us some money. But initially, we were just spending all our own money. Uh, but we ran bevy meals on wheels, so we did hot meals throughout COVID. And we're still going to do it and we're going to carry on doing it. And, and now we make those meals in conjunction with a, um, a, a local college that deals with uh, young people with learning disabilities. And they're, so they're doing training. They're also helping get that, those meals out. And we think that's going to have to carry on. Essentially, Meals on Wheels has been privatised. It's bullshit, basically. Uh, it's £6.50 a meal, whereas we, we make ours available for whatever price people can pay. Um, and we'll continue to do that. And that, and the, my experience at the Bevy led me into starting Brighton Food Factory. So, so initially we were looking at ways of addressing uh, food inequality through possibly ready meals made from surplus. But then COVID came along and we changed into basically a food wholesaler. So we travel out to farms. Uh, we needed to keep those farms going because they'd lost all their commercial business. So we go to farms and we supply the community food hubs with the just beautiful local fresh produce and again for some of those people I ne never really tasted this kind of gorgeous stuff that had been picked the day before or that morning and, and we had people just saying this this is this tastes completely different um and, and so we're looking to continue that way try and try and find the kind of missing links between how do you, how does that how do you make that produce available to everybody uh regardless of their income does that mean solidarity shopping you charge one person uh, a lot and you charge one person nothing and everything in between can you find ways of using vouchers or funding or corporate we're, we're, we're trying to look at all of those ways i even know uh, Kay, who, who who works at larder up in preston she's just told me that they're looking at blockchain as a way of doing this which which one i don't understand but two sounds really exciting uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath to hear from what Kay has to say about that. And the food factory uh, sort of leads me on to the Brighton Hope Food Partnership. Um, the Brighton Hope Food Partnership existed for a long time. Uh, they have uh, a coherent strategy uh, that looks right across the piece and tries to look at growing, tries to look at farming, tries to look at uh, what the council can do, lots of community projects. And in COVID, was the org basically the central organizer of the emergency food response in Brighton. So that ended up being the usual things of food parcel distribution and uh, coordinating volunteers and looking at things like admin, food safety, COVID safety, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I think Brighton was able to move quite quickly uh, because the food partnership got started even before the money was put into place. And they could draw on people like the Bevy to be there in that response in a quite a tight team that could just make decisions quite quickly and move forward quite quickly. 
And so coming out of COVID, we're, we're looking now at what comes next. Um, one of the things we discovered, obviously, with um, those food distribution uh, projects was, well, it's all very well when you can take over a school or take over the Brighton Centre. Uh, not so easy when everybody's back open again, yet the, yet the need is still there. So we're looking at possibly the need to have a some kind of building or a depot or a warehouse or something um, permanently in use. Also running the Brighton Food Factory, we were running the vans off my, my colleague's front drive, much to the annoyance of her neighbour. Uh, so we realised that really we need we need a depot of some kind. Um, so it's like, so, okay, so you need a building. The other thing the Food Partnership did was they... They helped these existing and emerging community food hubs to establish themselves, do some of the boring, shitty work around admin and, and, and food safety that, that, you know, just put, it's necessary, but it just puts you off, you know, it slows you down. So we, we, we were able to kind of mitigate some of that or hand out quick training and, and do Zoom training, et cetera. And those hubs, to me, is the most exciting thing that's happened in food, um, in the food scene for all of the time I've been trying to do this because the bevy taught me that the only real way to have proper, you know, you, everybody knows grassroots, surely everyone knows by now. Yes, you can, you can organize things and do infrastructure, but it's grassroots up because only, only communities can resolve complex issues. COVID showed that not only were community organizations perfectly capable of doing this, but they were the ones who, who knew who likes gravy um, and who, who doesn't like gravy? We already knew all these things. So it was really easy to sort out some of this stuff. Meanwhile, the government hands out generic food bags to people who, you know, are either got allergen problems or hate pasta or, you know, would, wouldn't eat a can of beans if, you know, it was the last thing on earth. So so that's, that's where, for me, democracy comes in. Real democracy comes from community from people knowing each other and then you can just you can have a look at that and go is anybody missing have we missed people out that's what i think councils can do and things like food partnerships can do is is see those gaps and try and help people with that because communities aren't always inclusive and they aren't always they're not perfect they're complex and dirty and messy but they're very exciting and they're very caring and in a way that's to me where we'll resolve our problems we can work on food systems, we can work with farmers, but ultimately it's when the NHS, it's when councils, it's when people like us really listen to those communities. The, the answers are all there. Thanks.